Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mega Projects. This one, I'm largely making. I mean, these things are definitely cool and all of that stuff, but I'm largely making this because people won't leave me alone in the comments about making a video about these. So if it's boring, I'm sorry, but it's the people in the comments as fault. <laughs> There are few events quite as awe-inspiring as the thunderous take of a spacecraft. Great clouds of fire gather underneath, billowing out from all sides, which seem to lift this man-made vehicle into the sky until it is but a faint dot. As it nears 29,000 kilometers an hour, it eventually breaches our atmosphere, and it's here that the outer space journey really begins. But for all the ferocious power and speed of an NASA takeoff, there is an important part of the journey that we rarely see. At 5.6 kilometers, it pales in comparison to a round trip to the moon, and at a sedate speed of less than 1.6 kilometers an hour, it is almost the exact opposite of a space launch. But make no mistake about it, no trip to the moon or visit to the International Space Station can begin without a painfully slow journey sat on board a machine of colossal dimension. NASA's crawler transporters, officially named CT-1 and CT-2, but nicknamed Hans and Franz, really need to be seen to be believed. They are the largest self-powered land vehicles in the world, and each one weighs an astronomical 2,712 tons. That's about a quarter of the Eiffel Tower, or 17 Statue of Liberties, without their bases. Size is everything with these monsters, but who can blame them when their most frequent passengers were the space shuttles, which weighed in at a hefty 2,000 tons and measured 56 meters from nose to engine exhausts. Now, if you're a little unfamiliar with space launches, you might be a little confused as to what exactly a crawler transporter is and maybe even why I'm getting so excited about them. No doubt many of you have seen a space shuttle launch. I mean, maybe not in person, but at least videos of them, right? There's a tower, there's a spaceship, there's a countdown, there's a big boom, and everything seems to happen rather quickly. But what we see is only a fraction of what happens in the build-up to a launch. Firstly, whatever is going into space is not assembled on the launch pad. This takes place in NASA's Vehicle Assembly Building, VAB, one of the largest buildings in the world, standing at 160.3 meters, with a volume of nearly 3.7 million cubic meters which is 40 times that of the Albert Hall. I've actually been there and I've seen this building and it is massive. It's truly like, you, you it's just unbelievably large. The VAB is 5.6 kilometers from launch pad 39A and 6.4 kilometers from launch pad 39B. And it's here that the sections of the spacecraft, along with additional fuel boosters, are carefully assembled. What we see nicely prepared on the launch pad as mission control counts down to zero has to be painstakingly constructed beforehand just a short distance away. Now I say short distance, but considering what needs to be moved, this is the spacecraft equivalent of running a marathon up Mount Everest. Once assembled, the crawler slides beneath the mobile launch platform, MLP, on which the spacecraft now sits before carefully lifting everything up and ever so slowly making its way to one of the launch pads. At this point, it carefully places the MLP and its space cargo down. In terms of Apollo-era machinery still in use, you'd be hard-pressed to find much. That is, of course, except these two giant crawlers. In the early 1960s, NASA explored several ideas related to how to move an incredibly tall and absolutely super-heavy structure like the Saturn V rocket without it all ending in tears. And believe me, there would be if that went wrong, <laughs> there would be a big explosion of many, many engineer tears. They toyed with rail and canal plans, but were drawn to the enormous earth-moving machines used in mines at the time, and after a rough design had been drawn up, NASA opened up the project for bidding. The lowest bid came from the Marion Shovel Company, located in Marion, Ohio, and after winning the contract, <laughs> Well, it was the lowest bid, wasn't it, government? It set about building two identical crawlers. In July 1965, CT-1 underwent its first test. It successfully moved an umbilical launch tower around 1.6 kilometers, that's one mile, but engineers were initially stumped when they found various pieces of metal lying around the crawler. Eventually, it was found that bearing races, rollers, and retainers from the crawler's traction support roller assembly had shared while moving, and the design was sent back for re-evaluation. It didn't take long to iron out the issues, and in January 1966, CT-1 
1961 performed the same test again, this time without shedding anything. On the 26th of August 1967, the first operational Saturn V rocket, part of the unmanned Apollo 4 mission, was transported by a crawler onto a launch pad at the Kennedy Space Center. And on the 9th of October 1968, the first manned mission, Apollo 8, again used a crawler to make the journey between the VAB and the launch pad. In those days, a single crawler operation required between 20 and 30 people, half on board tending to the various mechanical aspects and half walking next to it to make sure that nothing went wrong. Even today, between 15 and 20 engineers and technicians are required to make sure that the short but slow trip go smoothly. Now, I don't think we really need to go into any more detail over individual flights because these two crawlers have handled absolutely all of them and if I'm honest, there's only so much you can say about a big machine that picks up another big machine and moves it. But to put their use in perspective, NASA estimates that both crawlers together have covered a huge 3,000 kilometers, 2,000 miles, which, you know, isn't that far. But when you consider what they're doing, it's really, really, really far. For nearly 50 years, the large lumbering figures of NASA's crawlers have made their way slowly back and forth from the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida to various launch pads on site. Essentially, their role in a successful space mission is short and almost entirely unheralded, but these vast machines are mind-boggling and certainly some of NASA's unsung heroes. As I mentioned earlier, they're the world's largest self-powered land vehicles. While several machines are bigger, mostly large-scale excavators, they all run on external power sources. NASA's crawlers, on the other hand, come with their own engines and propulsion systems. So let's get some numbers out of the way first. They are 40 meters in length, 35 meters wide, making it slightly bigger than a baseball diamond. Their height is adjustable depending on what is on it and varies between 6 and 8 meters, while they can carry a frankly ridiculous 9,000 tons equal to 20 fully loaded 777 aircraft. That is ridiculous. 20 777s. But it's not all about huge numbers. Using its sophisticated computing system, this hulking giant can position and dock its platform on the launch pad to within half an inch of where it needs to be. The person driving it can also shift the entire structure by as little as an eighth of an inch. The crawlers come with two V16 Alco 251C diesel engines, pumping out 2,750 horsepower, which drive two 1,006 horsepower generators used for jacking, steering, lighting, and ventilation, and which also power 16 traction motors. At each corner of the crawler is a set of tracks, with each track coming with 57 separate shoes measuring 2.2 meters long, 0.4 meters wide, and weighing 900 kilograms. This means that every single shoe included on the crawler weighs roughly the same as two horses and there are 456 shoes these things are so big <laughs> somewhat ironically for such a giant mass of steel the steering wheel is only around 15 centimeters in diameter and while driver input is certainly important the majority of the technical aspects of the drive are controlled by an onboard computer humans are good but perhaps not good enough to be trusted to balance a structure over 25 stories high the journey is aided by a laser guidance system and giant jacking equalization and leveling jel cylinders at each corner which keep the entire structure stable at all times. But it's not just the mechanical giant above that has been carefully configured. The tracks that the crawler and its cargo travel across have also been carefully constructed, and when you think about what travels above it and how much it all weighs, it's easy to see why. A fully fueled space shuttle complete with its boosters, external tanks, and mobile launch platform MLP weighs in at a monstrous 6,000 tons. Now let's add on the weight of the crawler, and we get to roughly 8,700 tons, which is around three-fifths of the entire weight of the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. Now, you can't transport this kind of weight on a normal road. It would simply crack and then sink. The crawler tracks have been designed to withstand such enormous weight by having various carefully constructed layers that go down to around 9 meters. It starts with 1.8 meters of roadbed, including around 0.8 meters of crushed stone. The remaining 7.3 meters has been carefully settled and compressed to provide some of the flattest, most stable ground that you're ever likely to find. But this 
This also needs to be constantly maintained and assessed. The weight above is so much that when the crawlers pass over, its tracks essentially grind the top layer of rock to a fine powder. As I mentioned earlier, there are numerous people involved in a single trip, and one of the key jobs is to constantly spray the crawlways with water to avoid excess dust. If you're wondering about time, well, it takes in the region of six to eight hours to make the single journey between the VAB and a launch pad, which certainly puts rush hour traffic in perspective. This is done with a relay of drivers who swap every hour or two. When the crawlers were first built, they cost $14 million. Now, that's certainly not loose change, but considering these machines have been used constantly for over 50 years, a period where countless vastly more expensive vehicles have come and gone, it seems like an absolute bargain. Yeah, if, if you'd have said they cost $14 billion, I'd be like, a thousand, literally a thousand times more. I'd be like, okay, seems fair. And what's more, NASA expects to be able to use them for at least the next couple of decades. In recent years, we've started to see a resurgence of interest in space travel, and with NASA's next generation Space Launch Shuttle nearing completion and scheduled for its first launch in November 2021, one of the old workhorse crawlers has undergone an upgrade. CT2 has seen its load capacity increased, and upgrades were made to include larger, redesigned roller bearings and their lubrication system, as well as larger JEL hydraulic cylinders. The onboard generators have also been increased in power and a new large braking system has been installed. To top it all off, a brand new Cummins V16 twin-turbo diesel engine has also been added. CT1 has not received the same level of upgrades and will only be used for non-SLS loads from now on. When CT2 arrives at the BAB in November and loads the new Space Launch Shuttle, which many hope will even allow us to travel to Mars one day, it will be, in many ways, just another day at the office for this giant machine. These beer moths moved the Saturn V rockets at the dawn of NASA's space adventure, the Space Shuttle series over 30 years, and now the next glorious chapter in the story. When space vehicles blast off from the Kennedy Space Center, they're embarking on journeys of astonishing lengths, speeds, and complexities. But it all begins with a slow, tiny, yet epic journey on the back of one of NASA's monstrous unsung heroes. So I really hope you enjoyed this video, especially all the people in the comments who have been asking for it no end. If you have enjoyed this video, maybe you'll enjoy another channel that I do called Explored, which is spelt X-P-L-R-D. There is a link to it below. It's two videos a week, shorter than this, a little more documentary style. I, I still think you'll like it if you like this sort of video, though. Like I say, there's a link below, and thank you for watching.